So amen. Again, it's so good to be with you tonight. I just want to share with you, you know, um, like you many, and again, it is a blessing, you know, our, our <laughs> par for the course for 2020, our plans got turned around. You know, I was obviously was supposed to be here Sunday and preaching the Christmas service, and then I was going to be out this week, and Pastor Ty was going to do the service this Wednesday and Sunday. But since he covered for me the last two Sundays, I'm here tonight, and I'll be preaching this coming Sunday. Um, and so and so it is good, though. It's, it's uh, Again, it gives me a little piece of Christmas to be with you guys, but still having the stage and the Christmas music. And and I do, since we're two days away from the actual holiday, you know, like many of you, we've read the Christmas story, we've heard about the Christmas story. But you know, one thing we don't talk about a lot is God's timing in the Christmas story. You know, God's timetable is all over the Christmas story. So I want to look at that tonight. What does the timing of Jesus' birth tell us about God's timing for our own lives. So tonight I want to give you five lessons about God's timing from the Christmas story. Number one, God has a timetable for everything that happens. Don't you know that's right? Me and you are here in God's perfect timing. It's not an accident that we were, that we were born and that we're alive and that we're living in this, this time in history. Amen. God knew 2020 would come before we was even born, right? And that we would be smack dab in the middle of it, right? Look at Galatians 4, 4, and 5. It says this. But when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. At just the right time. Listen, when Jesus was born, it was perfect timing, right? It says at just the right time. And I just read that, you know, we celebrate Christmas and the birth of Jesus and we buy each other's gifts. Well, look, this was God's idea. God bought our freedom when Jesus was born. Amen. When he was born, his whole point was to go and to die for us. You know, God had been telling the world for centuries that he was going to send a savior. And God waited thousands of years until he actually happened. Why did God not send his son sooner? Because God had his own timetable for Christmas. We don't know why God sent Jesus when he did, but we know that it was the right time to do what he wanted to do. You know, the same is true in me and you's life tonight. God has a timetable for you and me, right? And everything that happens. You may not know it right now, but you can trust that God's timing's perfect. Like as you, some of you just raised your hands as I was praying for you about certain things. You may have been praying for that for years. Let me just ask you for a show of hands. Some of you that, that raised your hand about a certain thing. How many of you been praying for that for longer than a week? Let me see your hand. Longer than a month. Longer than a year. Anybody been praying for something longer than a decade maybe? Let me see your hand. And you're still praying about it. Amen? Well, God's timing is perfect. We got to know that. His time, he has a timetable for everything that happens. The second thing is that God does not tell us details in advance. How many of y'all know that? God doesn't tell us in advance details, right? Again, and I mean, I think that's one thing 2020 showed us, a lot of things we didn't know about in advance, right? So, although he has a timetable for you and and I's life, excuse me if my words might not all come out (laughs) correctly, my brain I think is still not all the way on all cylinders, He doesn't lay it all out in advance. Look at Ecclesiastes 3.11. God has given them a desire to know the future. He does everything just right and on time, but people can never completely understand what he's doing. Even if we try to figure it out, we try to figure out God's timing in our lives. And, And even though the Bible, even this is one, even though the Bible tells us, Jesus tells us specifically, no one knows the day or the hour or the time that Jesus has come back that Jesus is going to come back. Don't you know that every year there's still people that try to figure out at least, well, we don't know the exact time, but I think, brother, he said like a thief in the night. If Jesus said we don't know, we don't know, right? And people still try to figure out God's timing, but we won't. It, Jesus himself said that nobody knows the hour or the day like a thief in the night and even uses the illustration that if a, somebody knew when a thief was going to break in, they'd stay up all night and wait for him, right? And not let him break into your house. So we try to figure out even when something as clear as what the Bible says, we try to figure that out. Now, I do believe the time is getting closer, no doubt. But at the same time, we we try to figure it out, but can't completely always understand what God is doing. See, God didn't tell Israel exactly when Jesus would come. But the Bible said, again, Jesus came at the right time. You and I 
like to know exactly what's next in our lives. But that's not how God, are you like me? You're like, I like to have a plan, right? Like I like to know what's coming up tomorrow and this weekend. Anybody else like that? It's like, I like to have a plan for what's going to happen next week and what, you know, right? But God rarely lays out everything before us. Why? Well, first, because it would overwhelm you and I if God told us everything he wanted to do right now. Did you know that? If God showed us and told us, it would overwhelm us. If God told me that I would be pastor in this church 15 years ago, there's no way I would have ran for the hills. It would have overwhelmed me. And even in the timing, as God started revealing things to me, I, you know, it would, it would overwhelm us. We would likely run from it. Second, we may abuse it. What do I mean by that? We may try to change the bad parts of what God is doing. Of what God, you know, what we would have to walk through in what God has for our lives. But the most important reason he doesn't announce his timetable for your life and my life in advance is because he wants us to trust him. There would be no need for faith and there would be no need for trust if God would lay it all out for us. If he would tell us the time table and exactly how it happened. But he wants us to be able to trust him. Right. The Bible says curses is the man that trusts in the flesh, but blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. There's a blessing that comes with faith and with trust. Right. Everything God does in your life and my life is because he loves us. He wants you to trust him more today than you did yesterday. Right. And again, I think all of us, I think we've all got a, 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 a test and maybe hopefully even an increase in trust this year. The third thing. And a lot of y'all are going to know about this. God is never in a hurry and he's never late, right? Yeah, somebody said that, you know what? God is never late, but he's never early either, right? He's always right on time because you see, God isn't bound by time. He can be in the past, present, and future all at the same time, right? And he is. When I got that revelation, God created time. So he's outside of time and space. So he's like, man, God's going to be with you when you walk through that next week. Isn't it a confident thought? God's already in next week. God's already in next year. Like, if, I mean, we, 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 we forget that, uh, we, we, we forget that sometimes that God's outside of space and time. See, our view of time is, 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 is bound by the life, our life on earth. Our time rotates every 24 hours and travels around the sun every 365 days, right? We're about to celebrate a new year, and so the earth has made its orbit again around the sun, right? God's not bound by that. God doesn't live on a planet. The Bible says that the earth is his foot stew, right? Just like my foot is resting on this stew right here, that's what this planet is to the Lord, right? It says the heavens is his throne, and the earth is his foot stew. He don't live on a planet. He's timeless. He created time. He's never in a hurry, and he's never late. When the people of Israel were waiting for the coming of Jesus, it probably seemed like God was taking forever. Many maybe even thought that he was late. But the Bible says Jesus came at the right time, not a second too soon and not a second too late. And, you know, we got to have God's perspective on time to understand this. And 2 Peter tells us about this. The apostle Peter tells us in 2 Peter 3, 8, Don't forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. There's the Lord's perspective on time right there. A day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like one day. He's He's not bound up by, by decades and times and all of the centuries, none of that. But that's not how we look at time. When we're waiting on God to change uh, the heart of maybe a loved one, to meet a need, to heal our bodies, it may feel like a thousand years, right? Even though we ain't even lived that long, right? It may feel like you've been waiting and waiting and waiting. We don't like to wait, but God is timeless. I don't know, maybe you do. Any of y'all like to wait? Any of y'all are good waiters? Like, no, we don't, I don't think none of us like to wait, right? I mean, early I was trying to forward Amanda an email about something, and I was like, it's not working, my phone's not working. It's like, we're so used to everything being like this now, right? It's like, man, what you, we used to not even have email. Now I'm mad because my phone won't send an email instantly, right? We don't like to wait, and I think because of technology in our society, we're programmed more and more. It gets harder and harder to wait on God the faster that our society and technology gets. Come on, that's a good word right there. You know, this has major major implications for our destiny. God may have given you a vision for your life and for your future. You know, I know people, even leaders, who have given up on God's vision for their life because it's taken too long. They've given up because it's taken too long. 
you know, I'm just reminded of a mistake that I made this year, and I hope that I didn't blow my opportunity. A couple of weekends ago, I was up at my father-in-law's deer lease, and we were hunting, and it was a rainy weekend. It was raining all weekend. My family was there. We was up at, at the camp. It's a family camp, and it rained almost all weekend, off and on. We tried to run to the deer stand, and um, on the Sunday morning, it was the weekend after Thanksgiving, so I had took some time off. I wasn't here that morning. And, I said, man, we slept in. I said, I'm going to spend time with the family. It's raining and, you know, it's, it's just a deer piling that we hadn't seen anything. Deer ain't going to be moving. And, and, you know, so, but it stopped raining. My father was like, man, I'm running to the stand. I said, okay, I'm going to drink coffee with my wife and I'm going I'm to head out there. So I ran out to the stand a little bit later in the afternoon and went out about one, but it was real windy. And I've heard, and I know if you might have be some hardcore deer hunters out there. I'm, I'm, I, I do hunt, but I'm not that hardcore. I've always heard that deer don't move when it's windy and it was real windy and north wind and everything. And about three o'clock, the Saints were coming on. And I wanted to go watch the football game. So I was like, you know what? Man, I'm there. ain't moving. I ain't seen that done all weekend. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to pack up and head back to the camp. And there was about two hours left of shooting time. And as I was packing up in the back of my mind, I thought, you know, I'm going to go back to the camp and some deer are going to come out. Don't you know, about five o'clock, 30 minutes of shooting time left, two deer came out at the stand I was hunting at. And then my buddy got a picture and he texted to me. It's just like, you know what? I didn't want to wait two more hours. And because of that, I don't have any meat in my freezer right now. Right? Amen, somebody? And I hope that I didn't, uh, we're going to have one more time. We're going to try maybe next week to go run up there. But you know what? Why? I didn't want to wait. Two hours seemed like a long time. Come on, somebody. But I kicked myself all the way home. And even as I'm telling the story, it wasn't in my notes. I wasn't playing on it. I still feel myself. You ever kicked yourself before? Yeah, you ever keep, feel yourself kicking yourself? You know, so anyway, so we don't like to wait. I didn't want to wait that day, and I didn't, and it and it cost me maybe some meat for my family. You know, like I said, people have given up. I gave up. It just, again, that was just a hobby, and yeah, maybe some some good, fresh, you know, deer meat. But, you know, maybe that's you right now. Maybe you're you're ready to throw in the towel on your God-given dream. You know, it's it's not a big deal about a deer. There'll be other opportunities that I can, I can you know, harvest a deer but maybe for you it's it's your god-given dream is bruised and broken right now and maybe at the end of this year this year i was talking to a youth pastor at at the funeral home and he said man he said 20 was a doozy for me it messed me up you know maybe you've been beat up broken bruised maybe you dream before 2020 you got a god-given dream god's put destiny in your heart a purpose in your heart and because it's taken so long you're ready to throw in the towel i'm here to tell you tonight god doesn't want you to give up and I don't want you to give up either. Amen? Your God-given dream and destiny and purpose, though it may wait, Habakkuk 2, 3, it says this, there's still a vision for the appointed time. It testifies to the end. It does not deceive. If it delays, wait for it, for it is surely coming. It will not be late. Amen? God has a vision and a plan and a purpose for your life. And God has maybe shown you, you feel like you know what you're supposed to do or where you need to be at in life. You're not there yet. Wait for it. God's never late. Amen. If God gave you a dream. He'll make it happen. It just has to happen on his timetable, not yours. So wait for it. It's worth it. God's not in a hurry. He has a timetable that he will fulfill. And his timing's always perfect. The fourth thing. This is another thing. We don't, we're not good with patience. And number four, God's timing is not always convenient. Man, how many of y'all have been inconvenienced this year? Last week for us was a huge inconvenience. It was a huge inconvenience. And God's timing is not always convenient. God's plan for your life and his timing is good. It's for your benefit as well as his glory. But listen, it's not always painless. Let me say that again. God's plan and purpose for your life and in his timetable is not always painless. It won't always be easy. Think about, let's go back to the Christmas story, which is, is what we're talking about tonight. Think about Mary and Joseph. Mary was a pregnant virgin. This was impossible, and it put Joseph in a horrible situation. Think about it. For us guys, think about when you were back, you know, engaged to your fiance, and if y'all hadn't, you know, come together yet and she wound up pregnant, that would... That would spell trouble, right? I mean, come on, let's just look at the natural part of the story, right? And the Bible talks about it. Look, look at Matthew 1, 18 and 19. This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, before they consummated the marriage, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. 
Now in the natural, listen to what it says. Joseph, her fiance, was a good man and did not want to disgrace her publicly. So he decided to break the engagement quietly, which that's awesome, by the way. He was a man of God, right? He thought, man, you know, she she got pregnant. I'm going to go ahead. I don't want to disgrace her, even though, think about it. And he's like, she just did me wrong, right? And she betrayed me and he still didn't want to disgrace her publicly. So he was going to break the engagement quietly. But we know the next verse says the angel appeared to Joseph and said, hey, hold on, T-boy. I think he might have been a Cajun angel. He said, hold on, T-boy. He said, no, don't, don't break the engagement. Her pregnancy is from the Holy Spirit, and she's carrying the Son of God. I'm paraphrasing. The next verse, you can read about it in the, in the story. You should, I'm sure you have. So think about how inconvenient that was, right? They're about to get married. Now she gets pregnant by the power of the Holy Spirit. And he would have never believed her. And I'm sure that's why the angel had to show up. But I've never thought about this. Have you ever thought? Think about a conversation maybe with her mom. Hey, mom, I'm pregnant. Yes, I'm still a virgin. And by the way, the baby's God. That probably wasn't an easy conversation for her mom, right? And most scholars think that, that she was a young teenager, maybe even 14, 15 years old. When she had this conversation and she was engaged, you know, to Joseph. Think about how hard that must have been. So this wasn't easy conversations to have with her fiance and maybe her mom and dad. And then on top of that, Caesar Augustus decides to call a census and tells everyone to return to the time where they were born. Imagine if our government that did that and asked us to do that today. It would be chaos. Even during, let's say, even like during the Christmas season, every plane, train, and automobile would be booked and every highway would be full, right? People would be trying to scatter, going back to their hometown to, to take the census. And back then, of course, they couldn't call an Uber, right? Mary had to get on a donkey, take the long trip to Bethlehem. And uh, the day before she delivered her baby, and then she had must go and deliver her baby without family except for Joseph, along with a bunch of aminos, right, in a barn on top of that. How inconvenient was that? I said aminos on purpose, by the way. That was a joke. So Blue got that one. He understood. You know, this wasn't Mary's plan, right? You think she was a little inconvenient? Joseph married a family before the angel appeared to him and said this was a, a godly thing, that she was pregnant by the power of the Holy Spirit. This wasn't part of her plan. Her timing would have been much different, I'm sure, for her first baby. But the Bible says Jesus was born in Bethlehem, and that's how God orchestrated it. The Christmas story wasn't Mary and Joseph's idea of how they wanted to welcome their first child into the world, but it was part of a much bigger plan. Amen. Me and you sitting here today because of that plan. You know, 2020, again, was inconvenient for many of us. A year ago, who would have imagined that a global pandemic would have swept, pandemic would have swept through, that we would have needed to close businesses, churches, and school for months at a time, walk around wearing masks the whole nine yards. And the truth is, church, 2021 is going to have its own inconveniences. I just want to prepare you for that, right? It's going, 21 is going to have its own inconveniences, too. Your faith and my faith may be challenged again, but we can either throw in the tower or we can learn to lean on God and his plan for your life and your future. Amen? Jesus didn't say take up your cross because it's going to be convenient. Take up your cross is the whole opposite, right? We leave, you know, in a, in a very, I mean, even there's a, I, in Acts, the, the, the Bible talks about, there's a whole message I've preached on it. The gospel is actually an inconvenient message. When the gospel comes upon our lives, it's usually at the most inconvenient time, but it's God's perfect time, right? Our inconvenience is God's perfect time. And the fifth and final thing I want to tell you about tonight and with the Christmas story, what it teaches us about God's timing is at the right time, God can do anything instantly, right? That's the good news. God can do anything instantly. Isaiah 60, 22 says, at the right time, I, the Lord, will make it happen. At the right time, instantly, God can make it happen. God can do more in a middle second than me and you can do in our entire lifetime. Isn't that right? At the right time, God can and will do it instantly. God doesn't worry about time because he doesn't need time to accomplish what he wants to. Isn't that right? God does not need time. He's operate. He again, guys, he created time, right? He operates outside of time and space. So he doesn't need time. We've all said, man, if I only had a little more time, man, just give me a little more time. God's not confined by that. This is tough for us to accept. The most difficult place for us to be usually is in God's waiting room. You may find yourself in God's waiting room right now. You may be waiting for the COVID restrictions to be lifted. Maybe you're waiting on something in your personal life like a job, maybe a loved one to be born again or to come back to the Lord. Maybe you're waiting for a healing or a restoration of marriage. 
Maybe you believe in God for this holiday season in a couple of days that you could be restored with, you know, family and friends and, and, and maybe, you know, a, a relationship you hadn't, you know, that hadn't been on good terms for a long time. When you're in a hurry for something to happen and God isn't, that's God's waiting room, right? A lot of times we find ourselves in a hurry, but God isn't. God doesn't need a lot of time to do what he wants to do in your life, our church, our community, right? He can do it in an instance. In an instance. He said, let there be light. It didn't take a lot of time. When he said, let there be light, light appeared, right? Instantly, God created light in the earth and me and you in the plan to send Jesus, right? Israel waited for hundreds, even thousands of years for the Messiah to come. Galatians 4, 4 again says, when the right time came, God sent his son. It was at the right time Jesus was born and put all of this into motion. When the time is right, I believe he'll answer your prayers as well. Even 2020 or 2021 or 22 and 23 can't stand in the way of God's perfect plan and timing for your life. Amen? That's what the Christmas story tells us. I don't know if you've ever seen that before, but that's what it shows us, that God's timing was perfect through all of this. So just to recap tonight before we close, God has a timetable for everything that happens. Christmas story tells us this. God does not tell us in advance the details. Again, Mary and Joseph would have freaked out if they knew in advance. God is never in a hurry, and he's never late. God's timing is not always convenient, and at the right time, God can do anything instantly. I want to close with a verse that we started with, Galatians 4, 4, and 5, and I just read a part of it again. It says, but when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. Tonight, I want to ask this question. Are you free tonight? Again, we're buying gifts for people. I'm sure your Christmas shopping is probably all done. We're going to buy gifts. We're going to receive gifts in a couple days. You know, first of all, gift giving was God's idea, right? Because he sent his only son. God so loved the world that he what? Gave. He gave the greatest gift, his son. That whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And he bought our freedom through his son. He was born to die. Are you free today? And are you a child of God? The Bible says that. It makes it clear. Not everybody's a child of God. That's a misconception that people have. Like, oh, we're all children of God. That's not true. This verse makes it clear again. We're all God's creation, but we're not all God's children. The Bible says that he bought the freedom. Put that, that last scripture up again, Doug, if you don't mind. Let's look at it again. Uh, born of a woman, subject to the law. Keep going. Um, he sent us unto buy freedom. So those of us who were slaves to the law, he could adopt us as his very own children. You see that? We were not always his children. He adopted us in as his own children. Now, we can all become children of God, but we have to accept the greatest gift ever given, and that was Christ Jesus. Would you bow your head and just close your eyes and where you at? Even at home, even if you're at home, I just want to ask you tonight, are you free? You know, we're going to receive some quote-unquote free gifts that people are just going to give us. Maybe some of you do the Christmas Eve thing. Maybe that's tomorrow. Maybe it's it's on Friday. But our, our the greatest gift you uh, you can receive is freedom itself. Freedom in Christ. You know, we're all going to spend eternity. God's timetable is perfect. When we get to heaven, there ain't going to be any more time. It's going to last forever and ever. Time's going to go out the window. And we're going to spend eternity either with the Lord or separated from the Lord. So tonight, before we close, I just want to give you an opportunity. If you say, Brandon, I don't know where I'm going to spend eternity. I don't know if I'm right with God. I don't know if I'm a child of God. I thought I was, but the scripture makes it clear that we're, 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 we're all God's creation and he loves the world. He loves his creation. That's why he sent his son to die for creation for all of us. But we're not all children of God. The Bible says we've all sinned and fall short of God's glorious standard and the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. With every head bowed, every eye closed, even you at home tonight, if you say, Brandon, I'm not sure I'm a child of God and that, you know what, if, if you know, this was my last day on the earth as we just did four, three or four funerals, went to one tonight, where would you be spending your turn? If you're not sure tonight, you can be sure. Say, Brandon, I want to be sure that I'm a child of God and I'll spend eternity with the Lord. If that's you, I just want you to slip up your hand and I want to pray for you. Say, Brandon, I want to get right with the Lord. I see your hands. Is there anybody else? Even at home, ma'am, I see your hand right here. Praise God. Even at home, I can't see your hand, but the Lord can. Just raise your hand high, ma'am. I see your hand right here. This is the greatest gift you're going to receive this year for Christmas. 
is the gift of salvation. For those of you that raised your hands, both in here and at home, the Bible makes it clear. If we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and God raised him from the dead, the Bible says you will be saved. That word believe means to trust them. Like if you would jump out of a plane and trust that parachute on your back to save your life. We're all going to pray this prayer together. Those of you that raised your hand and as a family, we're going to pray it together. Just say, Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me and thank you for dying for me. Father, thank you for sending your son as the greatest gift we can ever receive. Lord, I receive the gift of salvation today. I know that I've sinned and I repent of my sin and I turn to you. I make you my Lord and Savior. Now give me the grace and the strength to live for you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Come on, why don't we celebrate with these tonight? Amen. Congratulations and welcome to the family of God. Those of you who are watching at home as well, online. If you if you made that decision, you prayed that prayer for the first time, there's a card in the pew in front of you that says, I made a decision. Go ahead and fill it out. You can bring it to the info center on your way out. We have a Bible for you, our own little gift for you, a few materials to get you going, um, and, and, and we want to pray for you moving forward. Amen. Why don't you stand up with me and let me pray a blessing over you as you go tonight, and, and we're going to wrap it up and let you get home and go be with your family. You may have some last minute Christmas preparation to do, and so um, it's just such a blessing to be with you again tonight, church family. Thank y'all. We love y'all. Thank y'all again for praying for us. Let me pray over you, Father. I thank you for my brothers and sisters tonight. Thank you for the wonderful Christmas story and the, the timing, Lord God, that shows us that your timing is perfect. Thank you that just the right time you sent your son to save us, to love us, to forgive us. Lord, I pray you'd bless all of these tonight as they go and tomorrow and the day after, Lord, as they celebrate, Lord God, the wonderful gift of Christmas, which is our Lord Jesus Christ. May you keep us safe as we gather around the table with family and friends. As we open gifts and share food together, may we keep you the center of it all, not only during this Christmas season, but every day of our lives. We love you. I thank you for these. Bless them and watch over them as they go tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Well, God bless y'all. We love y'all. Merry Christmas and we'll see y'all soon.